Hi, my name is Adam. Welcome back to Godot Game Lab. In this video, we'll improve the gameplay experience in a lot of ways. First of all, after implementing the enemy action system, we'll make sure that the player can actually see what enemies do with the intent displayed above them. Then we'll do a bunch of polishing and juice stuff to make the game feel a lot better. For example, if I play a blocking card, you can see that this enemy wants to attack me for 7 damage. And when it does, a couple of things happen. First of all, when the player gets hit, it gets a bit shaken and the sprite becomes white for a while. It flashes, right? And also, if I take damage from an attack, because I only get 5 block, and that means I should take 2 damage. And if that's the case, the screen will have this red tint for 0.1 seconds. Did you see that? It adds a lot, I think. But if I block for 10, you can see that the shake and the flash still happened, but we no longer see that red tint. It's only visible when we actually take damage. And the same applies to the enemy as well. So when I attack this enemy, the intent changes accordingly. And also we have this little shake and flashing effect, which adds some weight to the attack. So it's a bit more satisfying to play. So let's get... S whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on to your horses for a second. Hey, people. Editing Adam here. Just wanted to pop in for a second and tell you something important. Even though I might seem like someone who can create a project like this with relatively good code and architecture, turns out I still can't do primary school math. See, I told you that this course will take 8 videos, and that's true, but I forgot to count the intro video as a separate one. So yeah, this is not the last video, there's still one more to go. Okay, now let's get started for real. So before we get into the new stuff, I wanted to show you two things that were pointed out by your fellow lab technicians. The first is really handy, and I had no idea that this existed, so check this out. If we were to add a new scene, and let's add something that we already have a theme for, for example a panel node, and if we add the panel, you can see that it's the default black background we have here. And what we did is we went to theme, and we loaded the theme we had with this quick load feature. But as it were pointed out by one of you, there's a much easier way to do this. And this is super useful. So if we go to project and project settings, we can search for theme. And under GUI, we have theme. And here, the theme we set as the custom theme we have will be a project wide setting. So if I go ahead and click on this folder, and select our main theme.tres, you can see that it says that the editor needs to be restarted for this to take effect. And if I restart the editor and create this new panel scene again, so I click on the plus sign, other node, search for panel, and add a new panel as a root node, you can see that we still have no theme attached to this. But nevertheless, it uses the theme we provided as a default one. So this is super useful. We don't have to always manually assign this theme to all GUI nodes anymore. So this is super useful and I didn't know that actually. So thanks for the tip again. Awesome. And another thing we have is more like a bug, not a time saver like the first one. So actually two different people pointed out that we have some bugs with our reparenting stuff when we snap back the cards to their original position. And to illustrate the problems, I did a little change to the card UI scene, but you don't have to do this. This is just for illustrating purposes. So I duplicated this label, changed this color, and in the script, in the ready callback, I set the text to the child's index. So if we run the game, you can see that all the cards have their original index in the top right corner of the screen. So what problems we have? Well, if I play some cards, and end my turn. There's a problem when I, let's say I, I'll drag this defense card with the index two, drag it out and cancel the movement. See, it gets placed to the first place, even though we have its original index, which is two, and it should be at that position, right? So that's one of the problems we have, but we have another one. So if I run the game again, and let's see, I play one defense card from the left side and play an attack card from the right side. So another problem we have is if I start to drag this defense card and cancel it out, it gets 
place to the first position. And if I drag the first one, they go back to their normal positions and it still works for the first one. But whenever I do it with the second one, it doesn't work anymore, right? So these are the problems we have. How do we deal with this? So this is why I love teaching, right? Because you can always learn from your students. And this time I started fixing these bugs and I realized that maybe there's a simpler solution to this. And I started sort of rethinking this whole reparenting stuff and realized that there's a much easier solution actually, which solves both of those problems and simplifies the solution a whole lot. So I want to thank all of you for these recommendations, spotting out and reporting these bugs because I learn a lot from them too. And also that's sort of really a game dev thing. You could always come back to the same code and architecture over and over again. And oftentimes you could think of a better, simpler or more elegant solution. But mind you that you don't always have to do this. If it works, it works. At that point of time, you thought it was a good solution. And if it needs refactoring in the future, then you can go ahead and do it. Here we do need to refactor it because as you pointed out, there are some bugs and unexpected behavior connected to this. So how do we solve the problem? Let's start by modifying the hand script first. So if we click on the script icon next to the hand node, see what we need to do here. So right now what we do in this callback function is we take the child's original index and subtract this card to play this turn value and we keep track of how many cards we play this turn so that this reparenting can take that into consideration as well. And after reimagining this whole thing, I find this to be completely unnecessary. Even though it's not that complicated, it's still unnecessary. So what we can do is we can scroll all the way up and we can get rid of this member variable here. And also we don't need to connect the card plate signal to our hand anymore. So we can get rid of the whole ready callback as well. And if we go back to our callback function, we don't need this on card plate callback anymore. We can get rid of this too. And finally, when we take the new index, I still think it's a good safety measure to clamp the value between zero and the current children count, but still we can get rid of this subtraction. So we only clamp the card UI's original index member variable between zero and the child count. That's all we need for the hand. We can go ahead and open the card UI's script next. And here you can ignore this templateable stuff. This is only here so I can show you those bugs and whether the reparenting works as intended or not. Okay, so this is just temporary code. You don't need this. What you do need is to take this original index on ready variable and make it just a member variable. So we don't need to set this on on ready anymore. We won't set it here in the card UI and I'll explain why in a minute. And we can set this original index to, it doesn't really matter anymore, but we can set it to something like zero by default. All that matters is it's an integer value. Zero works perfectly here. That's all we need in the card UI. And see, my idea is to only set this original index value, which we use for representation, when we actually start interacting with the card, right? because you can only interact with one card at a time anyway, right? So you can only cancel out playing that specific card you started interacting with. And what that means is that we only care about the original index of the card we want to play, right? So if we set it at the time when we start to interact with it and it emits its reparent requested signal, then it will always be popped back to the right place. So when do we start interacting with the card? Here you can use two states from the state machine. I opted to use the clicked state because that's the first time you actually start interacting with the card in any way. So if we press Ctrl Alt O and search for clicked state, the only thing we need to do is when we enter this state, we do something like card UI dot original index equals card UI dot get index. And this will always get its current index. So it doesn't matter if we played cards or didn't play any cards yet. It will always get the current index of that card at the time of playing it or starting interacting with it. So it will always pop back to its right place, which is a much easier and cleaner solution than the one we had before anyways. Let's go ahead and save this and try it out. So if we go ahead and play the game, you can see, see that I still have these indexes here. And if I 
try to play the first one and cancel it out, it goes back to its place. And you can see that it works with every card, right? So what about those bugs we had before? If I play the first one and play the last one, these two were acting weird, right? So if I click on the first one, cancel it out, it goes back to the first place. If I play the second one and cancel it out, it goes back to the second place. So it's not swapping it up anymore like it did before. But what about the other bug? When we ended our turn and played the next one, it also got weird a bit because I played one from the right side of it and it popped back to the first place. Not anymore. If I try to drag the second one and right click, it only cares about its position when we start the dragging or the clicking process, right? So they always go back to their rightful place. And with that solution, our code has become cleaner, much easier to maintain. And we also solved all of the bugs we had before. So that's really cool. And that's the power of a teacher learning from his students. So thank you again for the tips. And I really like this new solution. So I hope you like it too. Now let's move on to the new stuff. So the next new thing we'll tackle is the enemy intents. If you remember from last time, we added all the enemy actions logic, but still we have no idea as the player what the enemy intends to do in their turn. So to implement this, the first thing we need to do is we need to create a new custom resource. So if we collapse this folder and go to custom resources, right click, create new script, we can call this intent.gd and make sure to inherit it from the resource class, press create and double click to open this up in the editor. And this script is actually one of the easiest we had to work with throughout this whole project. So the only thing we need to do is we need a custom class name and then this will be just a very, very simple data container. So we'll have two export variables, one for displaying the number or numbers, and one for displaying an icon. Because if you think about it in State Aspire, there's always one icon displayed above the head of the enemies. And for example, for damage numbers, you can see the number of damage that enemy wants to do to you. But still, the most data you can see is a string and an icon next to it. So it's pretty simple, right? So that's all we need. Go ahead and save this with Control S. And now we need to think about where do we use this? Where do we want to assign enemy intents to something? Well, if you think about it, the only place it makes sense is to attach intents to enemy actions, right? Because if you think about the crab enemies AI, it has three different actions. Two of them are blocking, which can have something like a shield icon. And one of them is attacking, which will have a different icon with a number attached to it as well. So these are different intents. So what we can do is we can press Ctrl Alt O, and search for enemy action.gd. And here we only need a small little change. We are creating a new export variable for the enemy action called intent with the type of intent. And that's all we really need here. So go ahead and save this with Control S. And with that done, we can create the custom intents and assign it to the specific enemy actions. So to do so, press Control Shift O and search for crab enemy AI to open up that scene, go back to 2D view. And first let's select the attack action. And you can see that we have a new slot for the intent, which is empty right now. So let's pause for a second and think about what do we do here? Intents are resources, right? And what do we know about resources? Resources are stored in the file system as serialized files with the extension TRES, right? So what we could do here is we could go to the enemies folder and go to the crabs folder, right click and create new resources and search for the intent class and create all the intents as separate files, right? That's the way we did this so far. But I don't want to do that here. Why? Why on earth would we do that in a different way than what we did before? Well, just think about it for a second. These intent resources are super, super simple, right? It only took us like two lines of code to create them because they only have two export variables, one for the string and one for the icon, right? And these resources won't do any logic on their own. They have no methods, no functions, just these two export variables. And they are just that simple, right? So what we can do alternatively for these, instead of 
polluting our file system with like number of unnecessary files because if you think about it from the whole game's perspective an enemy can have like 10 different actions and then you have to create 10 new intent resources and save them in a folder and you can certainly do that but the alternative way to do this is to click on this empty and click on new intent and you can see that we created a new intent here because it's no longer empty and if you click on this you can see that we have the number and the icon here and what this does is it embeds this resource into the scene itself. So you don't have to save it separately in the file system. And I think it's super useful for a simple resource like this. So for the attack, we can set the number to 7 to be the same that we have for the damage. And for the icon, we can load something from the art folder. I'll use this little knife here. Okay, so we have our intent resource, even though it's not saved in our file system, it's bundled to this scene. And we can do the same for the block and the mega block actions too. Click on this, the intent is empty. New intent, click on this intent. We don't need numbers for the block. We don't want to tell the player how much block this crab will gain. And for the icon, we can again load something. For the smaller block, I use this wooden shield, for example. And if we go to the mega block action and create our third intent, again, no number is needed here, but we can load the iron shield for this. And if we go ahead and save the scene, let me show you what I mean by bundled or inline resources here. So I opened up our crab enemy AI scene with a text editor because scenes in Godot are just plain text files. And you can see that, for example, here, we have this section called sub resource and we have the number which is equal to seven and we have the icon which is equal to another resource. So what this means is that all these intents we created are stored here as resources themselves. So we bundled them into the scene file. And because scenes are resources too, it's called a sub resource because it's a resource within a resource. And you can see that for example, the icon for this intent, which is this little knife icon we have, is indeed not embedded to this resource because it's not called a sub resource, but an external resource, which means that it's just referencing another resource. And if you take a look at this ID here, you can see that this external resource is a texture 2D and you can see the path too. So it's referenced by this ID. And in this case, I think it's much easier to have these sub resources bundled into the scene rather than creating three different intent resource files in the project's file system, polluting it with unnecessary files. However, I still want to point out that this is just another technique I wanted to show you and a personal preference of mine. See, that's the hard thing about game dev. There's no right or wrong ways to do something. It's just always a decision and go with the decision that makes sense to you. Here, to me, it makes sense, if we go back to the editor, to have this inline or sub-resource attached to this action, because if I want to modify somehow the crab's AI, I would open up this scene anyway. I, I don't feel like I gain any advantage by being able to edit the intent differently in the file system. Okay, so with that little lecture done, let's move on to the next step. Okay, so we set up the intents correctly for the crab enemies' actions, but we still need to somehow display them in the game. So we need to create a new scene for that. Click on the plus sign here, and as a root node, we'll use an hbox container here. So search for hbox container. We can double click and rename this to intent UI. Zoom in to see what's going on a bit better. And we'll add two new child nodes to this. So click on the plus sign or press Ctrl A. And first of all, we use a texture rect for the icon. And if we select this intent UI root node again, click on the plus sign or press Ctrl A. For the text, we'll add a label. And first of all, we can rename these. So double click on the texture rect and rename it to icon. And rename the label to something like number. So how do we do this design? And from the number, we can type in something like seven to test it. And for the icon, we can load something from the art folder. Maybe we can load a sword or something like that. 
Okay, so let's start with the texture leg because that looks a bit weird. We'll set the expand mode to ignore size and the stretch mode to keep aspect centered. And under layout, we can set the custom minimum size to something like 14 by 14, maybe. And that looks all right. And for the number, we want to make sure that it's centered on both the horizontal and the vertical axis. So let's set the horizontal alignment to center and the vertical alignment to center too. And if we scroll down under layout and container sizing, we can set it to fill the vertical space so it will be centered properly because you can see that it's set to shrink center. And if we change this to fill, you can see that it fills the whole height of the container. And now for the container, we can move this a bit. So from the anchor presets, we can select center top, for example, and that looks better. But we can still align all the items to the center of the container. And we can also change the size of this container a bit too. So we can use something like under the transform. 40 pixels is fine, I think, for the width. But that, this is really tall, we don't need it to be this tall. So we can do something like 14 maybe. Yeah, it looks a lot better. And also the icon and the number are a bit far away from each other. So if we collapse this and go to theme overrides and constants, we can check the separation for this intent UI. And you can see that zero, I think looks a bit better here. Okay, that's perfect. We can save this scene with Control S under Scenes, UI, and Intent UI.tscn is perfect. Press Save. So, why don't we go ahead and add some code to this to hook up the logic too? So, go ahead and select the Intent UI node, the root node, click on the Attach script, and Intent UI.gd is perfect for us. And here I want to show you another alternative technique suggested by one of our lab technicians in the comments. So you see, we always delete the auto-generated code when we start to write the scripts. And they suggested that if we go to this template dropdown, we can select object empty as a template and there won't be any auto-generated code. And that's true, but I think it's debatable which one is faster, like clicking on a dropdown and selecting the other one, or just pressing create and deleting the code right away. I think it's about the same time, so it's really up to personal preference, but they suggested that if I select this object empty here, then it will stay like this for the next scripts we add to. And if that's true, then you can save a lot of time, not having to always delete the auto-generated code over and over again. So we'll see how this goes. And again, it's up to personal preference. And I want to thank you for all these amazing tips and tricks. I want to display all of them to everyone watching. So we'll just do it like this for now. Press create. And you can see right away that the code doesn't have this auto-generated code we usually have. But anyways, what do we do here? First of all, we'll provide the custom class name like we usually do. And then we'll grab two already variable references to our label and our texture rect. And then we'll provide one method or function only, which we'll call update intent. And it needs to have an intent resource injected as a dependency, as a parameter. And we do a safety check first. So if it's not a valid intent resource, we can hide the intent UI and return from the function. But if it is a valid intent, then we do two things. First of all, we'll set the icons, the texture rects, texture property to the icon we have in the resource and then set the visible property. And we want it to be visible if this new icon we have is not null, but if it is null, then what that means is that the icon property of that intent resource was left empty. So for whatever reason, the designer only wants to display a number here so we can hide the icon. And virtually we do the same with the number property. So we set the number to the string we have in our intent resource and we set its visible property based on if it's an empty string or not. So if it's an empty string, then we don't really want to display it, right? Then we just only want to display the icon. And that's pretty useful because if you remember for the block and the mega block actions for the crab, 
we left this text box, this number string empty for the intent. And then finally, when we set up everything, then we can call the show function for this intent UI to make sure that it's visible to the player. And that's all the code we need. We can go ahead and save this with control S. And with that done, the only thing remaining to hook this up is to connect it to the enemy's already existing functionality. And we broke it up to two steps. First, we add a new intent UI to the enemy's scene tree, and then we'll hook it up via code. So first of all, let's go back to 2D view, press Ctrl Shift O and search for enemy.tscn. Select the enemy root node and click on the instantiate child scene button or press Ctrl Shift A and search for intent UI. Cool, now we added this intent UI to our enemy and we can go into move mode by pressing W to make sure that it's somewhere above the enemy, right? Maybe something like this. And that's all we need from here. We can hook this up with code. So let's open up the enemy's script. Here we only need to do some minor changes to the code. One of those changes is to get an already reference to our new intent UI, which we instantiated just before. And then what we need to think about is when, where, and how do we update this intent UI. So if you remember, we have this set current action setter function connected to this member variable. So whenever we change the current action we have with this enemy, this gets called. In this state, it's a pretty useless setter function because all we do is we override this value with the new one. But this is exactly where we can update the enemy's intents too. So what we do here is we check if the current action is a valid action and not null. And if it is valid, then we call this update intent function we provided in our intent UI's script. And we can pass on the current action's intent. And that's all the code we need. Pretty simple, right? And I think that adding this intent functionality to our project really showcases how easy it is to expand upon what you already have when the architecture and the code is good, right? If we go ahead and save this, that's all we need and our intent system should already work. So if we go ahead and play this, oh, you can see that, okay, it's working, right? This crab wants to deal seven damage to us, but if I attack it, Boom, it changes to the mega block action like we expect it to. So if I end my turn, you can see that it gains the block and it goes back to attacking us. So if I beef up with some block, then you can see, okay, on the next turn, it wants to attack again. But maybe after a couple of turns, because it goes back to its 50-50, if you remember, you can see that it wants to perform this smaller blocking action. And I want to do a small change here because I don't really like how far away this intent is from the crab enemy. I think we can do a bit better than that. So maybe we can go ahead and change this a bit. But it still works as intended, right? So hooray! But uh, I'll just change it up in the video to show you how easy it is to edit it. If we go back to 2D view in the enemy scene, I can just go into move mode with W and move this down a bit like so and play the game again to test how it looks ah that looks a bit better yeah okay i like this i think it can stay this way so that's the intent system done let's move on to polishing and game juice next so after being done with the intents themselves we'll add some polish to the game to give some weight to the attacks and make the game a bit more juicy a bit more fun to play and we'll do this in three different steps the first step is when we attack an enemy or vice versa, we'll shake that entity a bit. So when I attack this enemy, see it gets shaken for a while and then it goes back to its original place. Then to make this shake a bit less awkward, we'll also change the sprite to fully white when this shake happens so it flashes, so to speak. So if I attack this crab again, see it doesn't just shake, it flashes to this white color as well. It helps to sell the effect a bit more. And the final bit of polish is when the player takes damage, but only if it actually takes damage. Like here, we only have five block and the crab attacks us for seven damage. So what we do is on top of the flashing and shaking animation we saw with the crab earlier, we thin the whole game screen a bit red for a very short duration. So if I end my turn here, did you see that? The screen had this red tint for a while. It adds a lot more to this effect, but if I block for 10, you can see that the 
shake and flash animation still happened, but there's no red tinting, right? Because it doesn't make sense to do so when we don't actually take damage. So why don't we shake things up and start with the shaker? And camera shake and just in general shaking things is also a topic which has been covered a bunch of times by different content creators, be it Godot or Unity or Unreal or whatever. So again, the solution I opted here for is a pretty simple one, but if you don't like it, you want a more nuanced one or you want to have more control over the shakes, I recommend reading up on this topic or watching some videos because you have some pretty good short tutorials showing some techniques, like for example, using noise textures so the camera shake or shaking things won't be that erratic. Here I opted for a pretty basic and simple technique and a bit of a dirty one because we'll create a new auto load, which will be a global class accessible from anywhere in the project, which can basically shake anything, any 2D objects, be it the camera, the player, the enemy scene or whatever. Again, if you don't like it, I recommend reading up on the topic, but let's see how we do it here. So if we collapse this custom resources folder here, and the enemies folder as well. You can see that we have this global folder here, which is almost empty. We only have the event bus here, which is accessible throughout the whole project. So we create a new shaker script here. So right click this folder, click on create new script, and we'll call this shaker.gd. And we can test this theory we had earlier. Remember, we set this template from no default to object empty. And actually it swapped back to the node default. So if I were to press create, we had to delete the auto generated code again, but just for the sake of it, we can stick to this technique in this video and select this object empty and press create and double click to open it up in the editor. So how do we shake things? Remember, we can't use class name here because this will be added as an auto load to our project. So here we'll need a function and we'll call this shake. And we need three parameters, one for the thing we want to shake. This can be a camera, a player scene, an enemy scene, whatever you want. We'll have a float representing the strength of the shake and we'll have a duration, which is also a float and it's in seconds. So for how many seconds we want to shake that thing. First, we'll do a safety check because if we don't have anything to shake, we can return from this function immediately. But then if we do, first of all, we we'll store the original position so when we finish the shaking, we can snap it back to its original position we have. Then we'll have a shake count for how many shakes we want to do over that given duration. You can experiment with the value here to set something you like. 10 works pretty fine, I think. Then we'll create a new tween for the shaking itself. And we'll start a loop for the amount of shakes we want to have. And then for the shake offset, we'll create a new vector between minus one and one in both directions. And the target position will be defined based on this random offset by adding it to the original position vector and multiplying this offset with the strength of the shake. And then so it doesn't become too erratic, every other shake, so every second shake, every even one, will return the target to its original position. So it doesn't get too far away right from the original position because that would look weird. And then what we do is we tween the property to this new target position over the duration we want to have. But we can't just use the duration here because that would mean that if we have a 0.2 duration and 10 shakes, then all of the shakes would take 0.2 seconds and that would result in a two second shake instead of a 0.2 one. So what we do is we divide this duration by the amount of shakes we want to have. So instead of 0.2, if the whole thing is 0.2 seconds, we'll do one shake for 0.02. So 10 of them will add up to 0.2 in total. And then to make sure that it eases out eventually, we'll multiply the strength by 0.75, which means that it will be 25% less for the next shake. So it sort of eases out or decreases the strength based on how far we are with our shakes. And then finally, we'll connect an anonymous function to the tween's finished signal and set back the thing's position to its original position to make sure that when we're finished with this shake animation, it ends up being in the same place as it was before. And that's all there is to it. We can go ahead and save this with Control S. And don't forget that we need to add this as an auto load. So go to project, project settings, 
auto load and click on this folder icon to browse for this script. And under our global folder, we should have this shaker.gd ready to go. Double click this, and you can see that it will add it as shaker with a, an uppercase S for the class name, and that's perfect. Click on add and make sure that both of those are enabled. And they are, so we can close this. And now everything's set up for us to shake things, but we still need to call this function somewhere. So that's what we'll do next. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. Where do we need to call this shake function? Who do we want to shake at all? Well, we want to shake the player, if the player takes damage, or the enemy, when the enemy takes damage, right? So we need to change up their script when they take damage to make sure that they get shaken. So why don't we start with the enemy? Press Ctrl Shift O and search for enemy.gd. Here we need to make some changes to the take damage function. Because right now how it works is after a safety check, we call the stats resources take damage function. And after the stats change, we check if the health is less than or equal to zero. And if so, we queue free or delete this enemy. And even though we'll apply the same logic, we need to change this up a bit because we have to introduce tweens to make sure that we can wait for the amount of time while the enemy is shaking. So for now we can delete these. So what do we do instead? First of all, we'll create a new tween to make sure that this tween can manage everything we need. And then we'll call the shaker classes shake function through this tween and pass on the three arguments we need to, namely the enemy itself, a strength of 16, for example, you can experiment with this value. I found 16 to be quite okay. And then we'll say this shake should take 0.15 seconds. And then through the same tween to make sure that they are sequenced one after another, we call the take damage function like we did before and pass on the damage. And then to make sure that this shaker can finish this animation, we'll wait for 0.2 seconds, for example. And then when this tween finishes, so after waiting that 0.2 seconds, the tween will emit its finished signal, which we can connect an anonymous function to. So after this shake is complete and the take damage function has been called, we can still check if the stats.health is less than or equal to zero, and we can still queue free that enemy. So let's run the game to make sure it works, because that's all the modification we need now. So if I run the game, and play an attack card, the enemy shakes slightly, right? And then loses the HP just like it did before. Perfect. Now we can go ahead and close this and do the same to the player too. So press Ctrl Alt O and search for player.gd. And here the take damage function looks roughly the same. We take the damage and then check if our health is less than or equal to zero. And before actually deleting the player scene itself, we'll emit this player died signal from the event bus so we can recognize the lose state in the battle scene. So we have to pay attention to this too. But again, we can start by deleting this whole old code. And yet again, we'll create a new tween called the shakers shake function with ourselves and the same parameters we use for the enemies. Then call the take damage function, same as before. Then we'll wait an interval of 0.2 seconds to make sure that the shake animation finishes and then connect to the finished signal with an anonymous function. And here what we do is we have an if statement to see if the health has become less than or equal to zero. And if so, we'll emit the player died signal from the event bus and delete the player scene just like we did before. We can save this with Ctrl S and go ahead and play the game to see how it looks and end a couple turns to make sure that this crab enemy can attack us. Here we go, I can gain five block to make sure that I don't take too much damage. But in theory, yeah. Did you see the shake happening? Looks perfect. Okay, so that's it for the shaking actually. The first step of the polish is done. Okay, so we're done with this shaker stuff and it works perfectly fine, but it still feels a bit odd. And on its own, it will feel a bit odd, no matter what you do, I think. But just by adding a white flash to the player or the enemy while it's shaking helps a ton selling this effect. So why don't we go ahead and do this? If we go back to 2D view, you can see that we have our enemy scene here. And we have this sprite 2D node, which displays this enemy. 
And in our file system doc, if you expand the art folder and scroll all the way down, you can see that we have two files here for the white sprite material. So in Godot, every canvas item or canvas item inherited node has a material property, which you can override. And so what this white sprite material does is it applies a shader to that sprite. I don't really want to get into too much detail with shaders because I'm not an expert myself, but if we click on this, you can see that it's actually not that complicated. So what it does is it sets all the colors to white because in RGB 1.0 means 100% of that color. And if we take 100% from all the colors, then it becomes white, but it takes the alpha value of the texture we originally have and keeps that alpha value. So if we go ahead and select the sprite node again, and under the canvas items material, assign this material to it, you can see that it becomes white, but still the transparent pixels remain transparent. That's perfect, right? Because if I change the material, it becomes white. But if I reset this material, it goes back to its normal texture. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll set this material from code. And to do this, we'll apply some modifications first to the enemy script. So click on the enemy script icon and see what we need to change here. Fortunately for us, adding this new functionality isn't that complicated either. First of all, we'll define a new constant where we preload this resource, this white sprite material. And then in the take damage function, when we start taking the damage before we start any of the tweening stuff, we'll change the sprite 2D nodes material property to this white sprite material. And when do we need to change it back? Well, when the tween has finished. So the shaker has finished playing its shaking animation. So what we do in this anonymous function, we'll change the sprite to this material property back to empty, to null. So it goes back to its colorful version. And if we go ahead and play the game now, you can see that if I attack this crab enemy, it becomes white, shakes, then goes back to its normal state and becomes colorful again. However, I still don't like how there's this 50 millisecond latency between the two, because I set this tween interval to 0 0.2 to make sure that the shaker animation can finish playing. It still feels like it's lagging or something. It feels a bit too long. So we can set this to something like uh, 0 0.17 maybe. And I think this will feel a lot better. Yeah, it does. It does. It feels better. It feels more like a proper feedback. So this white, Flashing adds a lot to this shake effect if you take a look at this. It looks much better, I think. Awesome. Now let's add it to the player too. So press Ctrl Alt O, search for player.gd. And here we'll do the absolute same thing. Define a constant for the white sprite material. Then in the take damage function, we'll assign this constant, this white sprite material, to the sprite 2D nodes material property. And when the shaking animation has finished, then in this anonymous function, we'll set this sprite 2D's material back to the empty one, to null. So it becomes colorful again. And just preemptively here, I think we can tweak this interval value too, to something like 0 0.17. In theory, you could set it by the way to 0 0.15 too. But what I found happening is that sometimes they didn't finish at the exact same time. And even though the game didn't crash, it rendered some warning messages to the debugger that the tween tries to operate on a non-existing node when the player or the enemy get deleted. For me personally, I don't really like seeing warning messages. So by tweaking this value a bit, we can avoid this, but there's really no need. So if you, if you do 0 0.15, the code will still work fine. Again, you can experiment. So if we press Ctrl S to save this and run the game, that's perfect because the crab enemy wants to attack us. I get some luck. Boom. Okay. I got, got this flash animation too. So if I let him attack again, boom, it flashes. Perfect. So that's the shaking and the white flashing done. The last step of polish will be to add the red tint to the screen when the player takes damage. So the last polish we want to do in this video is this red tint when the player takes damage. And we need to think about this for a second. If we go ahead and play the game, let's get this crab enemy to attack us. Perfect. Okay, so now if I play two block cards, I get 10 block. 
So this crab can't really damage me, right? But if I end my turn and let him attack me, you can see that we still play these flash and shake animations. And I think that's perfectly fine because we want to give some oomph, some weight to the attack animation, right? So it feels a lot better, a lot more polished. However, think about this tinting for a second. When we display this red tint, it applies to the whole screen. When do we want to display this? Does it really make sense to turn the screen more red when we actually don't take any damage because we have enough block to block all of it? I think it would be weird if we still tinted the screen red in this case. So what we want to do instead is to only show this red tint polish when we actually take damage from an attack. And to do so, we'll need to provide a new event in the event bus for this. So let's press Ctrl Alt O and search for events.gd and we'll emit a new signal called player hit here, which will only be emitted when we actually take damage, considering our block. Uh, for now, that's all we need. We can save this with Ctrl S. So we can go ahead and design this tint effect itself. And to do so, let's go back to the battle scene and switch back to 2D view. And what do we need here? Well, the easiest way to tint the whole screen is to use a color rect node. And to make sure that it's displayed on top of everything, I think it makes sense to create a different canvas layer for this. So if we select the battle node, the root node, and click on the plus sign or press Ctrl A, we can search for canvas layer. Call this canvas layer something like red flash. And if we expand this layer group, you can see that it's on layer 1 by default. And the barrel UI itself is on layer 1. So if we want it to be on top of everything, we can set it to layer 2. And now we can add a new child to this node. And this time a color rect. And you can see that it's on top of everything. And if we set the anchor preset to full rect, it will fill the whole screen. That white color isn't really nice, so if you click on the color, we can use a different one. For now, I use this light red color here, but we can make this effect way more subtle if we turn down the alpha to something like this, right? It looks much better. You can see if I hide it, it looks like a subtle red tinting, and that's perfect. So for now, by default, we can turn the alpha all the way down to zero, so we don't see anything. And we can also add another node to this, a timer node, which will control how long we want to see this color rect visible when the flashing occurs. So add a new node, and this time a timer, and change the wait time to something like 0 0.1 seconds and make it one shot so it doesn't start over again when it expires. That's all the setup we need, but you can decide where you want to put this red flash in the node hierarchy. I think I'll just keep it here for now. Don't think it's that big of a deal. And to hook this up, we need to attach a script to this as well. So let's click on attach script. Click on this folder icon. And you can save it either in the UI folder or the battle folder, whichever makes more sense to you. In this case, I think it makes sense to save it in the UI folder. So we'll call this red flash, but make sure it's with the right naming conventions. So create this new script, set the template to this empty template so we don't get auto-generated code. And let's see what we need to do here. So I guess you could automatically assume that, okay, we need a new class name to this because that's how we start all the scripts, right? But for this one, we actually don't really need a custom class name because this tinting the screen will handle all the logic by itself. So we don't need to hook this up anywhere else in our code. It's fine by its own. So what we do here is we reference the color rectangle and the timer we have. And then in the ready function, we need to connect two signals to our own callback functions. First of all, we'll connect this new player hit signal, which we have in our event bus, and then connect the timer's timeout signal to our own callback function as well. And what do we need to do in each of them? For the player hit signal, what we do is we crank up the alpha for this color rectangle so it becomes visible to something like 0.2, but you can tweak this however you like. And then we start the timer. And when the timer times out, we can set the alpha for the color rec right back to zero. So it won't be visible again. And that's all the code we need. So if we go ahead and save this with Ctrl S, we can test the game 
how this looks like. So if I run the game, you can see that I can't even end my turn. And no matter if I hover over the cards, nothing happens. I can't interact with the cards either. There's no yellow borders. I can't end my turn. What the hell is going on? Well, I don't know if you remember, but UI nodes can be tricky in Godot. If we go back to the 2D view, this color rectangle fills up the whole screen. And you might remember that for color rectangles, they by default stop all the mouse events. So this color rectangle for the red flashing will prevent any other UI nodes to pick up any mouse input. So we need to set this filter from stop to ignore. And if we go ahead and save this and run the game again, I can interact with the card so everything's back to normal, I can block, but if I end my turn, still no red tinting, right? Why is that? Well, if we go back to the script, you can see that we only display these color rectangles alpha or crank it up to a bigger value when this player hit signal is emitted. And we define this signal in the event bus, that's absolutely fine. And we also connect it to it, which should work in theory, right? But we never actually emitted the signal yet. So the last thing we need to do is to create the logic for emitting this signal when the player actually loses HP from an attack or an effect. And there are actually multiple places where we can implement this logic. But where does it make the most sense to do so? Well, I think in the character stats. Why? Well, because losing HP or deciding whether an attack can be fully blocked by the player is really connected to stats, if you think about it. The logic is, is really connected to stats, whereas the player script, for example, which is more like a visual representation of the player, if you remember, isn't really concerned about fully blocking attacks or all that kind of icky stats handling stuff. But the character stats class is really concerned with this, right? blocking, taking damage, mana, and all that stuff. The take damage function itself was first defined in the stats class, right? So let's press Ctrl Alt O and search for character stats.gd. And here you can see that there is no take damage function. So where do we actually decide this? Well, if you remember, the character stats class is extended from the stats class. So if we go back to the stats class, this class has a take damage function. Well, we have all this logic, right? Taking the block into consideration. I know it was a while ago, but we did this together, right? So what we can do in the character stats is we can rely on that same logic we have in the base class, the stats class, but further extend it with our own functionality, which is in this case, deciding whether we really took damage or we were able to fully block it. So that's what we're gonna do. So here we can define our own take damage function it only has one parameter, which is the amount of damage we take, and it's a void function, meaning it doesn't return a value. And here what we do is we store our initial health we have in a new variable, and then we call super.takeDamage. So what does this mean, this super keyword? This super keyword means that call the take damage function from the class which we extend from. So in this case, Call the take damage function from the stats class, right? Which handles all the logic we need, right? It handles taking damage, taking block into consideration, and all that stuff. And after we're done with the original take damage function, we can see if the initial health is bigger than the health we ended up with after taking the damage. And if it is, then it means we actually lost some HP from that attack. So then we can emit this player hit signal. And that's all we need really. If we save this script and run the game again and get this crab enemy to attack us. Cool, okay, so now, now we can test this. So first let's see if I play two block cards and I have 10 block, we shouldn't emit this signal because the initial health will be 35 and the health I end up with after taking the damage will be 35 too. So what this means is that I shouldn't see the red tint if I end my turn. And I don't, perfect. But what happens if I only block for five? In this case, I will take two damage, right? And my initial health will be 35, but the health I end up 
is 33. In this case, I take two damage, so we should see the tint for 0.1 seconds. Let's see what happens. Awesome, did you see that? Did you see that we had this red tint thing going on? It's really subtle, but I think it adds a lot. Okay, so we've done everything we wanted this video, and I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.